Well, I really want to thank Stephanie for this program, which I think is wonderful, I, uh, and all of the programs that you supervise that have to do with bringing students into uh, the museum. It's something dear to my heart, and I always brought classes to the museum every term. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Bruce Gunther for um, creating this installation, because it's just perfect for our conversation. Um, and it's in how curators kind of juxtapose things together. This Rauschenberg um, with, uh, Ray is a, a West Coast artist. He lives in Oakland. And, um, but originally from, from Pittsburgh. But he's often compared to Basquiat, which is a little ridiculous because of the difference in their ages. But since Basquiat was in New York, of course, he would have been more known in high art circles, right? <clears throat> so I, in thinking about how to start this um, presentation and I hope discussion, um, I always start here with a label. And when I started with the label, so when I was asked to talk, it had to do with the relationship with my work to an artist. And I chose Ray because I've known him. And um, I think it's such a puzzle. Um, and also, but I, there are many things, of course, that I don't know about him. And so looking at this, um, one of the things that I noticed is that he was from Pittsburgh. So I looked up, he's born in 1991. So my work also has to do with history and place. So I looked this up, um, Pittsburgh, uh, what would have been happening in 1934 when he was born, and how did he get there? Um, so Ray is, it's, it's like, do I profile this first or last? Um, he's an African-American artist. And so I thought, well, Pittsburgh. And so what was happening then? And how did he get the training that he had, which was very high Beaux Arts training? And it turns out that uh, Pittsburgh was the home of Carnegie Steel, right? And the Pullman uh, train cars were um, made there. And so his family was part of the northern migration from the south to the north, no doubt. Um, so I was thinking about this period in history when Pete Seeger just died. Um, they were talking about Robeson's, um, the riots that happens in Peekskill and with the Ku Klux Klan. So you're thinking about what an artist's life has been like um, over growing up. Um, he, one of the things that endears me to him, and I, while I'm kind of doing this introduction, I want you to see, I brought a catalog because one of the hard things in a museum like this is, is that we only see one piece of an artist's work. And really, to understand the iconography, to understand the thinking of an artist, it's much better to see a whole series of work. So um, this catalog will give you some other ideas about what he's interested in. Um, I also will pass around a statement from 1967, which I think is pretty, pretty interesting, that he, moved, he made, and it's quoted a lot. So um, you can like to, you can just pass it right on, yes. All right, so one of the things that I first became aware of, uh, Ray, when I would go and buy fruits and vegetables, because in Berkeley, so I don't remember whether I was a student at that point or teaching one of the schools there, but my fruit and vegetable market had something very similar to this. One pair, you see that there? Well, around the top of uh, all the fruits and vegetables were one pear, one banana, all these beautifully drawn fruits and vegetables with these simple statements on them. And there was something so wonderful about this relationship of art and life, mundane life, just buying the food. Um, he also had uh, work in restaurants. Uh, and I was told that he traded uh, work in uh, probably at the um, market as well as in the restaurants. So um, how did he get introduced to art? Well, the Carnegie family also started a great museum and had an international exhibition. And so at age 10, he got to go and take art lessons. So he started very early. 
And I was lucky enough to also have that privilege. And it's one of the things that happens in a big city, is that you get to, um, that the, it's, these things are accessible to all kids. Um, and so his drawing, as you will notice, is quite amazing. Um, and yet, at some point, you can see that um, that wasn't enough. So he can draw. The Beaux Arts tradition is drawing plaster casts. It's, uh, you have to draw those for a long time. And then you get to move on to draw the life figure. And um, you learn to paint in a very classic way, doing the grounds. So, And grounds is a good thing to be thinking about. What is the ground, if we think of figure and ground in this work, what would the ground be? So what's the figure, what's the ground? Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about, so this is his early training. He has won all the important awards. He had a Prix de Rome, um, which is a two years, his stint was two years in Rome, where he traveled all around um, Europe. He, um, also has had a Guggenheim Fellowship and many NEA fellowships um, when the government was funding the arts. Um, so this traveling has been an important aspect of his life. And I was at a lecture of his probably in the late 70s where this kind of configuration started to uh, become part of his work. And he talked about going to Egypt and the color and then this geometric um, patterning. Now, um, he is a trickster. He is not going to let you pin down anything. So everything we do will have to be speculative, right? I mean, it's very important for him, like he's a poet. You know, it's very important that he, for him to think of himself as um, elusive. So on one hand, we can grasp an idea, a chair, but then there's more to it. Did you all notice there's no seat in this chair? Right. So he picks these things up, like Rauschenberg, and the relationship to Rauschenberg has to do with the rebus. So Rauschenberg did a series of small rebus. So what's a rebus? A puzzle, right. So it's something to be read, right? So. Um, if we're reading this, where do we start? Anybody have a clue? I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, you know, because they're, it's, yeah, go ahead. That just draws it. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what could this refer to besides my thought that it has something to do maybe with Egypt or a different color sense? What? Simplicity. Mm -hmm. So is there an art movement that simplicity would be? Minimalism. Minimalism, right, possibly, right. So um, also I think this, the ground, what, what color is the ground? Black, and everything is superimposed on that, right? So now if you read the statement that I have passed around, you'll see that he denies race as having to do, that he doesn't want he does not want to be a political black artist. It's, it's, this is in the 1960s, right? Why not? What's the disadvantage of? It pigeonholes you. Yes, I don't want to be a woman artist um, where I have to speak for all women. He doesn't want to speak for everyone, right? And yet he owns it, right? So it's the ground of being. He's not pretending this doesn't exist. So how is he talking in a very, one of the things that postmodernism does for us that's different than the modernism that I, the tyranny of modernism that I grew up with, is what? What are the postmodern kind of, come on, I know play. some, uh-huh, play, good, uh-huh, and certainly this is playful, uh-huh, what else? Uh-huh. Possibly, yeah. Right. Multiple cultures, multiple points of view, right? Multiple styles. And multiple styles, yeah, in this case. Now, one of the things, actually, I meant I should have gotten you all to get up before we started this, but um, this 
says, Lucas, next movie, Tuxi Tuskegee Airmen. OK, so what does that refer to? Now, this, this painting is done, or this assemblage is done in 1991. So what do you know about the Tuskegee Airmen? The Red Tails, the Red Tails yeah. And, and when was that movie actually completed? Last year, I hear that that movie was completed. So this has taken 30 years to get this movie done, right? That was pretty amazing to me. Um, so they are the black um, fighter pilots, the bombers, um, in World War II. So do you want, can you say anything else about them? Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Right. 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 right, yes, good. So it's one of the things that, um, in looking at this work and trying to read the rest of the iconography that's going on here, I think that this is an important piece of it. And um, so we have these cultures. His studio is in Oakland, which has a very interesting um, Chinatown. It's kind of a it's a real working Chinatown. Compared to San Francisco, which has a kind of tourist Chinatown, this is a really you know, bustling place. And so th this reference here. And then what's going on here? Can, it, can you read it? Blues. A blackboard, yeah, being erased. So this erasure is something that he does in a lot of his work. And it, interests me the idea of words and then erasures. And in, in a culture that wants to be dominant, European culture has always been that it's, it's its history. It's the written word. It's, this is one of the things that makes it dominant. So it always interests me that how he'll put words in and then erase them as though, you know, that's not the only way to say it. <laughs> you know, there's this other, other ways. Um, so if looking at the catalog that I sent around, you can see that um, there are certain iconographic elements, including the hearts in both of them, and this very beautiful isotopic projection kind of drawings um, on here. So there are some more puzzles, though, I think. And what are they? What other puzzles are there in this? A mixture of, uh, of found objects with uh, original material, uh, often it looks like superimposed or back and forth. Um, I mean, I think the paintings up there are found objects. You know, right. I, you know, he, he didn't do those. No, of course not. <laughs> so, what do they represent? What does that painting represent? What? Come on, say it out loud. Uh, impressionism. impressionism, maybe. Any Certain, other? Uh, uh, reference to domesticity? Yeah, I think so, sure. Um, Maybe a Sunday painter, but certainly in the European tradition, yeah, right? A, a, a tradition of, of uh, representation, representation of painting like that and the landscape next to it. And right. So, you know, yeah. Maybe a summation of European tradition is here. You know, you have one is the landscape, the other is the interior still life, right? Uh huh. So what's above it? What is that mysterious? Uh. Good, yeah, Pinocchio's nose, yeah. So where is the lie? Now we have really a, a, a big challenge here. We have to figure out this in the rebus. Where is the... Um, 
Any, any other thoughts? Well, there's a softness yeah. and a romanticism, it seems to me, to those two pieces, that sort of frameness. Right. And so when, you, when somebody says something about the riddle or the lie, you wonder if, if, he does, if he's not saying something about life for a lot of people, or sort of not, it's not like that. Right. It's not that idyllic thing mm-hmm. that existed. Mm-hmm. I don't know, it just seems like putting them together. Right. They kind of clash with each other. I don't know. Right. And I, then, of course, I wonder, so how does, maybe it fits here. What was the story with the Tuskegee Airmen when they came back to the, I mean, after the war? Right. They were right back. They start from, and that's, that's the other thing. It's like um, somebody was saying, oh, I guess you're about being an artist and not a black artist. And I wonder. Mm-hmm. Right. Not a black fighter pilot. And so I think that's what made it all the more harsh when they came back, was that they had no status. Right. With regard to their so then we come to this. And how does this have to do with my work? Well, when I, I think it was possibly that period of time when. Um, Everyone was going, tra- the, the idea of, um, what was it called? Um, the Peace Corps was started, right? So this is when I'm, I'm in art school, but I have children very young, so I'm not traveling just any place. Um, but I do get to live in Brazil for three years. And um, so this other culture and being other and learning about what it is like to live in a different culture, to speak a different language, um, is one of the things in my work, and I've only studied, I studied Latin American art history, I studied African art history and Asian art history. I just went to Italy last summer to take an art history class in Italy. I really uh, did not do any European artists. I mean, I did some Northern Renaissance, but it was the thing that I avoided. And I think it's not that, I knew it was part of the times. But, um, whoops. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that really resonates with me in his work. It's this um, learning about other cultures and um, redefining the place in the world. Um, so this chair. Now, suppose he picked this chair up um, on the street someplace, which is how he got his material. Um, what interventions did he make um, to the chair? I mean, so what, what do you think he did? did? Was it just like it is, or who? who? Never had a seat, <laughs> uh-huh. Well, maybe. It could have been without a seat, but he certainly didn't well, decide to put one in. Uh, looks like, well, yeah. Looks like he actually manipulated them a little bit. What else? What about color? What about writing? Uh huh. Yeah, A B plus J is what it says. Well, something is crossed out there. There's a plus. So I don't know if it refers to a mathematics or you know. But it's interesting to me that these kind of primary colors um, on the on the chair, and I mean, it's really a radical idea to put a chair like this on the wall, isn't it? I mean, I have to say, one of the things I love about his work, and I hope to remember in my own uh, work, is he has so much freedom. (laughs) And and he really, um, his playfulness is so wonderful. And he is very productive. He he does, um, I've seen work of his in galleries in Los Angeles. And you know, you go through stacks of drawings that he's made of flowers and all kinds of things. He has this very, a uh, powerful way of working, and yet he can be incredibly delicate and um, um, with heart, you know, with this sweetness that's, that's really quite wonderful. So anyway, we have the puzzle of the chair, and we know it has no seat. Anything else that we can connect together? I mean, how is this, the 13OX, this, 
does this kind of go with that? Portraiture would be the other art form that's European, right? So obviously she is, I mean, who was it who portraits were done of? The wealthy and the privileged, right? Yeah. So, um, The symbol of beauty, yeah. Now, he has a wonderful title um, for, for one series of his work, and it's um, Beauty is Empathy, which I think is really gorgeous <laughs> myself. Just a wonderful way of thinking about um, his work. Um, he did a whole series on Pittsburgh, you know, growing up there, with including some of this iconography. Um, the vessel is one of the things that he uses repeatedly. It often is a black vessel with white, so it's on a different ground. So if this is all on a black ground, it's the vessel is um, on a, a different ground. What is this reference? The stirrer, right. So, and it stirs what? It stirred this, this paint, right? So he wants you to know about the process. Look, I'm not hiding what I'm doing. This is, this is the stick that I stirred this paint with. Here it is, right? So it's this enormous amount of permission, you know, to, to kind of play with things and... Um, Mixing literal and <laughs> metaphorical things. Uh-huh, right. And I, I think of it as poetry because I think that it's not, never planned. It's, it's a matter of working and collecting things all the time and having various things around the studio and always juxtaposing them and putting them together. And then the story emerges for him, you know, because many artists, of course, we don't really know what our work is about until maybe a year or two later or maybe later than that. Uh-huh. I just sort of assumed, well, oh, it'll always go to a different piece. And this one is a one that sometimes come back to some struck that this one is so powerful that people come back to it. Plus, it seems to me that it was last Valentine's Day. It's the last person. Oh, we it's, it's Victor, right. It. Yeah. And it's something about it seems to draw. Well, them. what's interesting is Victor, who I know, um, is, was a student of his. I was a colleague. We shared students back and forth. He was at um, the... Um, uh, California College of Arts, and then it was Arts and Crafts then. Um, and then I was at the San Francisco Art Institute, and so we often had students that we crossed. And I have to, he was such a gracious person. I mean, I had negotiations with him periodically uh, over students, and um, his commitment to education, to, to, uh, it was enormous. Um, so, so I'm sure that Victor was totally smitten with him in a certain way. And I think I have a little more distance. I don't know what, what the difference in conversation was. I looked at part of that uh, video, too. Yeah, I, you know, it was hard for me to choose. I must say there are a lot of wonderful work. Um, there is a, another interesting part of this is that Pearlstein and Andy Warhol both studied with Ray Saunders at the Carnegie Institute with the same painting teacher. So, and it's interesting that you get to see the Pearlstein as the models in the studio, which is at the other end of this, uh, this floor, so you can look at it when you go, and how differently they work, you know? I mean, this is, this is the fascinating thing about art, is that people who study it in the same place and the same come out with such incredibly different points of view, such different um, work. What is this about? Mm -hmm. And how much is about something he wanted to say intentionally or unintentionally. 
I continue to look between the article of the, from the Tuskegee Airmen and the portrait, the oval portrait. And if indeed the mask is from Africa, if that's some identification with those roots, I find it interesting that he chose a black mask on a black ground, mm. took the article that is includes a photograph of the gentleman and makes it so you they become almost no not even almost they essentially become invisible from the right. distance whereas the other portrait and all of the things that i think of as being european and the chinese checker so i don't know how that fits into my thinking about this <laughs> but whatever um all of those things are lighter brighter and stand in front mm. yeah but they're tarnished they're old they're uh, worn they are Mm -hmm. But they still sure. stand Probably. in front. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. being other, uh -huh. when you are other uh -huh. in a place, regardless of how or why you are other, um, sometimes the easiest way to keep getting through is to take that otherness and fade it back. Mm -hmm. You know, just erase it a little, take it out of focus, right. so that it's not threatening to anyone, anyone else. else. Right. Good, yeah, that's very nice. Franz? Well, uh, listening to you, listening to everybody, giving you some perspective of his hard work, uh, I'm saying he tried to uh, express that uh, integration, uh, democracy uh, in, New York, uh, in the United States, that uh, it's a melting pot, doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. Right. The chair also, I meant to mention this, in African uh, history, there are something called status chairs that are status stools or chairs. So chiefs, and they're beautifully carved. I mean, it's an, it's an art form. So Ray is a really smart, educated guy. I'm sure he knows that. <laughs> you know, I know that, that that would be a reference for him as well. So, um, so as, as a symbol of status. But it's been robbed of its functionality. Right. And it also, it seems to me, it's kind of more of a child's chair, isn't it? I mean, who's, who's, who's sitting in this chair, you know? Nobody. Um, I mean, who would, you know? Right. No, I think that's part of it. I think I, I, uh, it seems like it's a twin. Everybody twins about reaching to the point that you can sit on the chair. Right. Uh -huh. With all the pulling of powers of uh, separate, being separate, separate. Being different mm -hmm. cultures, being uh, different uh, mm -hmm. heritages, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, like Sydney said, that there's to go under the radar, perhaps. Uh -huh. I view the chair as an empty dream. An empty dream. Mm -hmm. you know, Although he's had a very good life, I have to say. Well, I, which I, is great. <laughs> well deserved, life. right? I think he's trying to express to everyone that there is this promise. That How are we doing in terms of time? Six forty. Uh -huh.
Oh, well, now where are you seeing that? Oh, right, of course. Like, good for you. Yes, I thought of yeah. Right, and on the East Coast, we did duck and cover forever. <laughs> Uh huh. Nice. Yeah, I had not thought of that. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. Absolutely. I knew. <laughs> uh huh. Well, that was 45, right? 44, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which was bombing, too. So, of course, that makes this then yeah, have that. Mm -hmm. But, and it is really like a white bread kind of thing. Well, Lloyd told me that, um, that, in, that the, um, in the steel mills, that uh, the Pullman cars, they brought in uh, black workers um, to fight against a strike by white workers. So you can imagine this creates a really great kind of, uh, so, and so this is all happening in, during this period. Rita and Ian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at this and, and learn. And the other comment I, I have, I've seen Mother Well in the, <laughs> in the two oh. testicles at the. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. This, uh, so there's an artist, Mother Well, who did very calligraphic kinds of uh, mark making. Uh, yeah, very possible. And there's this little, which he does these kind of marks quite often, in, as you might have seen in that catalog that went around. So anything that we haven't? Uh... So I have a question about mm -hmm. background and figurine. Mm -hmm. Does the background have to be for the whole thing? Because, because for me, the two horizontal um, triangles pop out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it seems like, for me, as I first looked at it, it was like, oh, it's a statement about the new day. Mm. You know, kind of like the story has a better future, or I don't, I don't know, but that's why I asked if the background really. Well, you see, figure ground is one of the things that artists usually are interested in with figure ground is, is having it move, you know, is not being static. Oh. So that's an interesting comment. And uh, <clears throat> how you're perceiving it is, reminds me of op art, which was also a movement coming kind of out of Germany, kind of um, where, you know, it does, it was to fool the eye, you know. To... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, and that, of course, I think we're digressing, actually. <laughs> That's good. Uh -huh. Could you be more explicit in terms of how you feel like this relates to what you do? Oh, 
right. Well, um, the, or what? The kind of, yeah. So obviously the aesthetics are not mine. You know, he has a very different kind of aesthetics than I do. Um, but I am interested in cultural aesthetics, in how we get imbued. And that came to me out of living in Brazil, where <clears throat> I could tell, I have a northern kind of aesthetic. I mean, like dark, rainy places. I mean, I did a whole series of night landscapes, which you cannot believe that the dealers, like, what is this, all black? <laughs> no. I thought they were very beautiful, really, but, but they would have nothing to do with them, right? <clears throat> so it, it, there is, I, you know, there's a, do we, and now this for me is always a question, because I also do not want to be, you know, imprisoned, but I have this question about where does our aesthetic come from? You know, how is it, um, there is a writer who has written about that during the culture wars when everybody, pre pre predominantly evangelicals, and then uh, the artists who they were against were Catholic. And so how does that, how is there a sensibility created by growing up Catholic that makes you react in a certain way, often Latin Americans, you know? And, it is, and so there's a certain way of working. So I, you know, I don't want to imprison anything by these things, but it's a big question for me, how these aesthetic decisions get formed. Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, the international, the um, studying many cultures I already spoke about. Um, I like how he makes his work and his life. Um, you know, going to the vegetable market, that was really important to me. It's like it always made me happy to see his simple drawings up there, you know? And so it's that relationship and the playfulness. You know, I would hope that, I mean, sometimes I can be playful, but I. I've been pretty serious in the work that I've done. Maybe that's another one of those things. It's nature, you know. But uh, any other questions? Well, I hear that we have a happy hour downstairs. And so if you have any other things you want to talk about, we certainly can, can continue them downstairs. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat>